Good morning, church. There's the sound. All right. So for our call to worship this morning is a prayerful poem that I wrote throughout the week after sitting with today's scripture that Pastor Michelle chose for us, after reading the beautiful communion liturgy she'll read us through, and also after pulling weeds with Linda Rudowitz and a lot of y'all this Saturday at the church cleanup, these words came to my heart. So I invite you to hear them in a posture of prayer. This morning, we turn aside to worship. From the lonely places deep in our hearts and from the hecticness of our everyday lives. We come to this time of worship to experience the holy, to experience the sacred through sacrament, word, and song, but not just in those things. We too experience the holiness of this space, the sacredness of this moment in the everyday things of life. We experience them in this sanctuary, the earth as our sanctuary, for sanctuary just means a sacred place. And the earth too, our homes too, are sacred places for us. So wherever you are, whether you're here with me today or you are at home, wherever you are watching and experiencing this worship service, I invite you to close your eyes and take a deep breath. church, feel the chairs underneath you, the ground or the floor beneath your feet. Feel the breath in your lungs. Now, if you are online, open your eyes and take a look out of a nearby window. If you're in person, look around you. Remember that even though the birds who sing right now, they don't know what tomorrow will bring, but they still have a song to share with us today. Remember that even after a year like we've had, the rhododendrons are blooming beautifully for spring. That even though our body, the body of Christ, is set apart over the internet and in person, six feet apart, sometimes 12 feet apart, and with these beautiful masks, we are still here to worship. Our presence is a reminder of Christ's presence with us. In times such as these, when we are in the in-between, where we don't know exactly where we are going. Remember that worship orients us the way we should go. Church, we are surrounded by all we seek this day. We are surrounded by hope and love. May this time together help your eyes to see, your ears to hear, and your hearts to feel the truth of that in your everyday lives. Amen.
Thank you, Julie, Tim, Chris. Good morning, church. And good morning, those who are watching virtually. Now we're going to take a moment. I know we're masked. I know we're already set in place. But folks, I'm missing the fellowship of the church. So I'm going to invite you to do by protocol the right thing and stand up and take a minute and just greet those around you. Will you take a moment to do that? Greet one another so it feels like times of old and honor that protocol. There's people in cars, too. Don't forget, we've got some, we got some folks in their cars. You may want to shimmy on up there and say hi. And folks at home, it's so good to have you. Greet those who are in your house and, and perhaps invite someone when you have a spare moment to do that. Invite them to join in on our service. Good to have you today. Good morning. <clears throat> and if you don't know, Pam's daughter... Katie is with us today. She's say, uh, Katie, I do this. We are so happy you're here. She's getting ready to get married, and Mama and Dad have been getting all excited about helping her plan. Katie, it's so good to have you with us today. <clears throat> yeah, and Katie, Katie Hastings, we're glad to have you too. <clears throat> so, folks, thank you so much for being with us today. We've got a beautiful day to celebrate creation and to celebrate back uh, on the lawn worship. We don't know when we'll be inside, but things are looking better and better. We thank you for taking the chance to be with us this day and hope that you'll invite some others to join you in the coming Sundays. Let me just offer a prayer of thanksgiving for you, for this beautiful day, and for the ability to be able to worship in these times. Will you pray with me? Oh, gracious Lord, we thank you for the gift of this day, for the beauty of the sunshine, for the collection of folks who have gathered, 
who are your saints in this place for such a time as this. We thank you for those who've come with family. We thank you for those who are at home, who tune in and who are so grateful that we have a, a hybrid way to do worship. Lord, we know that in the future, it won't only be on the grounds that we sit, but we will be doing worship in a whole new vernacular for a whole new church world. Thank you for stretching us and growing us. Thank you for the gift of your son who gives meaning to our life every day, who created all of this beauty that we may enjoy it and live into it in the fullness, and who gave us the ability to be able to love and serve you wherever we go, however you lead. Thank you for the gift of life and love and breath, which we realize these times more than ever, the sacredness of breath and life. Be with us, inhabit our praise, fill us, with your spirit. In your name we pray it. Amen.
Our scripture this morning comes from Acts 1, verses 1 through 14. And this passage is a sacred pause of sorts, a passage that kind of points us to the truth that we heard in the song that the praise band just sang. So as I read this passage, we'll do something a little different in the scripture reading. I'll have a few prompts for you, um, either to reflect on the words that you hear, um, to think about what you're feeling, what the apostles might have been feeling, um, or even the nature that surrounds us. So remember, this is the story of us. This is the story of the early church. It's our beginning. So where do you hear hope and where do you hear possibility? In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach when he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, 40 days signifying trial, tribulation, but also completion. And I spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them the command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with the spirit, for jo excuse me, for John baptized with the water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Church, I wonder what restoration meant for these disciples asking that question. Likely liberation from Rome, Freedom to be God's people to live as they hoped God wanted them to live. The way that Jesus taught them to live. But to their own wonderings, Jesus replied, It is not for you to know the time or the date the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. A cloud hid them from their sight. Church, take a moment to wonder. If you are in person, take a look at the sky. If you are at home, look out your window. As you look at creation, put yourself in those disciples' shoes. What was going through their hearts? What emotions were impacting them? Once more, Jesus had left. Once more, they were in an in-between time, after his ascension and before the outpouring of the Spirit. The disciples were intently looking up to the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has taken, who has taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go to heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartho Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his disciples. May these words mean something for us today, tomorrow, and forever, church. Amen. As we think about the departure of Jesus from his disciples and life as they knew it with him, I don't know what goodbyes are like for you, but for me, Depending on the DNA that I share with the person doing the leave-taking, and depending on the resonance of the relationship, when that one that I love so deeply leaves, there's an interesting mix of emotions that are a part of leave-taking for me. It's melancholy. It, it's joy for the time that we shared and, and thinking about the memories that we made. But also, especially in these days, it's, it's a bit of anxiety and fear about when and if I might see that person again. Life as we know, more than ever, is unpredictable. And it might be an, a, an old cliche, but we know it's true that every breath that we draw is a gift. If COVID has taught us anything, dear friends, it's taught us of the importance of breath and life. 
When my dad died in 2009 of a silent and really insidious stomach cancer, we had precious little time to prepare for his departure. He was in the process of building a beautiful home for, for my mother and himself, Greg and I having long left the house. It was a home that he designed himself and he was really proud of it. As you might imagine, he had a long list of things that were yet to be done on this house. And the problem was it was all in his head, that list, none of it was written out. So much of life needed to be lived in that six months that the doctor projected rather cautiously that, that we had. So much of life, so much that we had to pack into that little amount of time. We decided with Daddy that we would leverage the time for good. We made plans. But little did any of us know that only 11 days later, 11 days later, he would leave us. Even his surgeon was caught off guard. Friends, the time between my father's diagnosis and his sudden departure seems like a fog to me. He was not just for my family, but for our community, one of those larger than life people. My dad was one of those guys that left a wide wake wherever he went. <laughs> Whether the ripples and the waves were on the sea or the shore, that's just the kind of guy he was. Either you liked him or you didn't, and there was no in-between, and he was just fine with that. But if you met him, you would never forget him. He was rough and tumble. He was outspoken to a fault. But he was one of the most compassionate servants and loyal friends, especially friends, especially to all who lived on the fringes of society. I'll never forget when he put Marty and her sister in our car, kids from across the tracks. And one day I said, I don't want them to ride to church with us anymore. And he said, you, my girl, can get out and walk. They're riding. He had enough love and care for everyone, and he taught us that. And if I may say so myself, at his visitation and celebration of life, there were people lined up outside the door. What on earth was life going to be like without my daddy? How were we going to live in that liminal space of his departure? Between his living out loud like he did and, and the cavernous absence of him among us. I think about him every day, and frankly, I'm still trying to figure out how to live meaningfully without him. He was that important to me. In Walton County, Georgia, just outside where I bought our first house, where my husband and I bought our first house, when I served churches in the North Georgia Conference for some 14 years, outside of that, there lies a little town with a whopping population by the 2000 census of 296 souls. It's still increasing in size, and the census shows a beautifully diverse and culturally mixed group of folk in that little town and age groups as well. It's a little North Georgia gym that you could see or that you could travel to easily from Stone Mountain. It was first settled in the 1850s and incorporated in 1908 by the Georgia General Assembly, and it was later decided, though not without a big fight, to name the little town between Georgia. I mean, that was the name of the town, Between. Between. And though the origin of the town and its naming is the stuff of legend, I think the simplest answer is probably the most logical one. Between Georgia is located equal distance between two shining stars in Georgia, Atlanta, home of the Braves and the Falcons, and where Jade and I went to seminary, and between Athens, Georgia, home of the Georgia Bulldogs, between Georgia. This Sunday is Ascension Sunday in the Christian calendar. If you grew up cutting your teeth on liturgy in the church, then you already knew that. If you didn't know it, you might not have known it had you not seen it on the cover of your bulletin today. Ascension might have just passed you by. And Ascension is one of those church holidays, one of those church feasts, one of those church events that is tucked away between Easter and Pentecost, and it gets little attention. 
It lacks the fanfare of rising from death to life that the, that the Easter story brings. It, it lacks the fanfare of the Holy Spirit that Jay will be preaching about in a couple of weeks where the tongues of fire descend upon the disciples and they start speaking in, in unknown tongues that they couldn't even speak when they walked in the room. Ascension lacks all of that excitement. But literally, the ascension occurred 40 days after the resurrection of Christ and 10 days before the Pentecost giving of the Spirit. Ascension in Christian understanding is not an insignificant occurrence. It has theological and it has practical implications. Perhaps it's the Christian art through the centuries that have left us a little, hmm, questioning the ascension and the whole business, how it took place. Some of the most interesting artist renditions I've seen of it have, are of Jesus' feet hanging from the clouds as he ascends upward to heaven. And then the disciples looking on below with eyes as big as saucers and mouths gaping wide open. Some folks find that kind of rendition comical. Others find it endearing. Maybe we get too scientific about these things ascension and resurrection. That's why I love the cover of the bulletin. Some of uh, our staff looked at it and said, what is that? Well, you just got to imagine. This is Jan Richardson's work, one of my favorite authors and ministers, uh, a pastor out of Florida. And you can see in it what you will, but it leaves something to the imagination. I love the white brush strokes, which seem to suggest to me that the robe flying away. Uh, in the air. Look at the blues and the golds. I have no clue what those mean. But I invite you to get your own brush and your own palette and paint what you understand the ascension may look like. Even if we don't find ourselves believing that heaven is up there, we still find ourselves looking beyond the pull of gravity. I don't think there's anyone among us, believer or non-believer, who doesn't want to believe that there's something beyond this life. People who love the life so much that they live that they want to suck all of the marrow out of it and continue to live as long as they can, minus all the things that come along with age. We can leave those behind. Who doesn't want to live as long as they possibly can? Here's the scoop, congregation. The Mount of Olives significance or the Mount of Olives ascension must have had meaningful significance because it made it into both the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. The ascension is there. Let's see if you remember the Apostles' Creed with me. Say it with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Say it with me, congregation. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And we'll stop there. He did what he ascended into heaven. So it made it into both our creeds. We have said this throughout most of our Methodist life, we just don't always think about the significance of the words. While this story is about Jesus, it is surely about the disciples and about us. What the Ascension did was not only fulfill what Jesus promised with many convincing proofs, as Luke tells us as the author of Acts, with many convincing proofs over the 40 days, what the Ascension also did is it shifted the focus from Jesus as the leader of the troop to the disciples who were now handed off the ministry like the passing of the baton. The mission now fell to the disciples to preach the good news, to heal the sick, to feed the hungry, to grow the movement. And further, Jesus tells his friends just before liftoff that they're going to take this ministry global to the ends of the earth. No wonder they stood gazing up to heaven with their mouths open, statue-like. Here are these two reasons that the ascension is important. And I don't have it all figured out, but this is what scripture teaches us. Without the ascension, Jesus could not have sent the enduring and life-sustaining Holy Spirit. Now, why they couldn't have done this thing in tandem, I don't know. 
But the understanding was that for Jesus to be able to impart his spirit that would inhabit the lives of disciples then and now, he had to leave. And with that impartation of the spirit, the movement could grow. It could move from land to sea and from continent to continent to continent. And it was necessarily, as we read scripture, that Jesus leave for the Holy Spirit to be given and for that ministry to expand. And without the ascension, Easter and resurrection would make no sense. Think about that. Without the ascension, Easter and resurrection would make no sense. Not for Jesus, not for us. Just as death did not have the final word for Jesus and Jesus lived again, so too we have the promise and the hope of living forever. However that looks, I don't have a clue what living forever looks like. I don't know if it's up. I don't know if it's God coming and recreating where we live. I don't have a clue. However it happens, whenever it happens, I believe that God's got this. And it's a beautiful thing left to our imagination. Whether it involves our feet hanging from the clouds as we spring up from the grave, or whether it involves you and I finding ourselves upon our last heartbeat and breath in an unfamiliar, inexplicable realm where we sense beauty and love beyond compare and where we feel in the depths of our soul that we are not alone. Whatever that looks like, I don't know how it all works. And friends, sometimes I think we ask way too many questions. God is God and we are not. Why do we have to understand it all? Sometimes we just walk in the faith until we find out what it's all going to be like. So here's the lowdown, congregation. In between times, in this liminal space, on Ascension Sunday and all the days afterward, before the coming of the fiery Holy Spirit, and especially in all the days and seasons that follow, it is... As St. Teresa of Avila said way back in the 1500s, it is this for the church. Christ has no body now but ours. No hands, no feet on earth but ours. Ours are the eyes through which God sees the world. Ours are the hands with which he blesses. Ours are the feet with which God goes about doing good. Friends, this is a tangible mission that we as the church can live out in the world. It's a message that's real and relevant and resilient. No matter what kind of church comes out of this pandemic, no matter what emerges, what form of in-person hybrid worship, worship outside the walls, worship outdoors, worship in a local pub because that's where some people go, or worship on a bike because some people can get into nature more than they can behind the walls of the church. Whatever it looks like, the mission still stands and God still needs us as disciples to embody it and share it. If you believe it with me, church, will you say the word amen? And amen. The only sacrament of the church that we're allowed to repeat, because in your baptism it took the first time, you don't need to redo it. The only vow that we're, or the only sacrament we're allowed to repeat is that of Holy Communion. And today we have the special privilege of being able to actually share it with protocol, with careful protocol, here together. So receive this call to communion. If you don't already have your communion bulletin and uh, your cup and wafer, will you lift your hand and let someone bring it to you? And if you at home will go ahead and make sure that you're ready to start receiving communion with us, we invite you to sit at the table of love with us. It's a separate bulletin. Lift your hand if you don't have it. It's got a beautiful table on the front of it. As beloved children of God, let us seal ourselves to this mission with the sacrament of love and forgiveness and grace. And as we receive this sacrament, friends, I want each of you to think about your baptism. Think about the call and the commission that's been given to you in your baptism and be thankful.
Let us hear the liturgy of communion. Church, from the lonely places deep in our hearts and from busy places just around the corner, we come to this feast of longing and fulfillment. We come knowing that often our expectations of what we will receive outweighs our certainty of what we will give. Nevertheless, we come knowing that we will give what we can and receive abundantly the grace which knows no bounds. We are keenly aware that this table, all barriers are mute, all distinctions are neutral, all grievances are pointless as the intention of the host is clear. All are welcome at the banquet feast. Rich dine with poor, friends dine with enemies, men, women, youth, and children gather to remember love. Love born in a stable, transfigured on a mount, crucified on a hill, and resurrected in our hearts. Each time we set this table. Divine presence, spirit of wisdom, holy grace, come dine with us today, our hearts are open. Will you enter into a time of confession with me? As we prepare to receive this feast of grace, take a moment to offer thanksgiving for the God who is in this life of yours, who is in this church, and who is in the world. Take a moment to just give thanks for God. Now take a moment to confess your known sin. The things that trip you up. The addictions you have and that I have are shortcomings. Give those up. Ask for a new path. And now let us ask that what we cannot see in ourselves, that God may reveal to us. Now receive this invitation to the table. There's a part for you to join in on the following page. Friends, let us gather from wondering at table of friendship and communion with God. God is with you. God is with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give our undying thanks to God. It is right and good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to offer our thanks and praise, O oh God of beauty, love, and grace. And now, O oh God, we ask that you now make this bread and cup a sign for us, a sign for us of your endless presence with and among us. As you feed us, make us bread for the world. If you go ahead and take your wafer, you can take your mask off to take the wafer. And now take your juice cup, and as you quench our thirst, O Lord, make us water for a thirsty world. give you just a minute more it can be a little tricky for those of you at home you're having a much easier time than those of us here it's worth getting into it's a life-giving sacrament yeah. 
Will you now receive this prayer? O God, you have bound us together in common life, which we have celebrated at your holy table. Help us in the midst of COVID, in the midst of our grief for the way things were and our uncertainty about the way things will be. Companion us in our continued struggles for justice and truth to speak and act as your spirit directs, even if it is hard. Beckon us through tough talk conversations together to have those tough conversations in the name of love and grace. Help us to give up our need to always be right and to be ever open to the stirrings of the spirit within us and with a community who engages in discerning prayer. Amen. Most of all, may we walk in love as Jesus best modeled for us. For to know us by our love is to receive Christ. Before the band gives a reprise, I ask you to hear this benediction. As we leave worship today, nourished by word and music and sacrament, let us remember that part of Christian living is always living in that liminal space of betwixt and between. Between the already and not yet, between the mountaintops and, and the valleys, between fear and, and faith. But we all already know how to live that way, friends. Some of you among us today have lost not just one, but two parents this year. And you've had to learn how to live in that in-between times of having them and not and making sense of that and integrating that pain in your life. Some of you are in broken relationships that you're trying to mend even now, and in that in-between time, Good and hard work is being done. Some of you are in between careers, given COVID or something else, and some of us are trying to reinvent ourselves in retirement or thinking about retirement. Who doesn't live in between times when they just ate a baby for nine months and wait for its coming? Or when after losing a baby, they live in that in between time of trying again? Who doesn't live in between when we're waiting for the results of a biopsy or when we're watching a parent or a friend or a spouse slip away to Alzheimer's and learning how to live a new normal at every stage? When don't we already know how to live this way because we've lived through this time of COVID and waiting for our vaccines to take effect so we can kiss and hug and share life again with family and friends so we can travel again for Pete's sake. And so we can worship indoors again, church. If that's not in the in-between time, amen. That's living in the in-between time. All these, all these instances are like the little gem of a town in Georgia between one thing and another. And if we will allow the Holy Spirit to use it for good, it can strengthen us in our personal lives, and it can prepare us for all the new ways that God may be calling us to be the church in this post-COVID world. May we anticipate it, and more than that, may we welcome it. Amen and amen. One, two, three, four.